Okay, so the format for this particular session is a little different than the others. If you have a question, there's some questions in the back, and Sherry's standing in the back. Those of you who don't know, since there's community people supposed to be here, Sherry, why don't you wave? She can give you one of these pads, and you write down your question, and I'll be happy to read it. And this young man behind me will be happy to actually answer it, maybe. So he's going to have some things. He's going to start out by explaining to you, giving a little bit of information about himself. And this time, since when you talked to the students, you didn't tell them your name. So tell them your oh. name. <laughs> so uh, uh, so uh, when he introduced himself, he's going to say some things about himself, which I'd like you to listen to that first. After that, we start the questions. I'll, answer, I'll ask a few that I already have. And then as you decide ones you want, Give them to Sherry, raise your hand, she'll pick them up or pass them up to me and I'll read them, okay? And you've got your instructions about where to stand? Yes. yes. Right in this area. All right, so why don't we go ahead and start? You're on. All right, well, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, and I'm very humbled to be a candidate here at Mojave Community College, the other MCC. And um, this is a great uh, opportunity for me to come down here and talk to you and learn more about uh, the Kingman campus and more about Mojave Community College. But uh, what I want to do is say thank you all very much for being here. I, I know we have one of our board and governors here, and uh, very nice to have, have you here as well. Oh, psh, I'm sorry. Um, she's incognito. Um, I, I was given her grief. She's wearing beautiful pioneer blue, um, which is the, the colors of the school I currently work at. So I appreciate it. Oh, and she has a red purse. So perfect. Um, and, and to the faculty and staff and the administration and students and also to uh, people who work in the foundation and donors and also to our alumni. Um, so who in here graduated from uh, this institution? Absolutely amazing. And I found that at every place I've been, the alumni base who stay and work at Mojave Community College is incredible. So thank you all very much for being here and, and hopefully representing the alumni and not just you as a, a faculty staff or some sort of administrator. So thank you all very much for that. Uh, so again, I'm very humbled to be able to be asked to be down here and be one of the four candidates. And I know that this has been a long two day process and I'm the last one. And so what I'm gonna do is talk two more minutes, answer two questions, and then we'll be done. So you have an early evening exit. Good luck, I know, good luck, it won't happen. I totally understand. Um, so, um, but what I wanted to do is just say that I, I know that you have uh, four very well qualified candidates that have been in front of you the last two days and you're going to have a, deci a difficult decision uh, to make. But hopefully for you it's one of those beautiful things that you're finding somebody or individuals that are going to come back and help you lead in the future, help provide uh, maybe a, sometimes a new way of thinking, uh, be able to provide maybe a, a very good, fun and enjoyable work environment, whatever else it may be. That's what I'm hoping that you find in that person. I'm hoping I'm it, but at the same time, I totally get that you have that fun, tough decision to make among the four candidates. So I am very humble to be considered among with the other three candidates. Um, what I wanted to do um, tonight or today, this afternoon, is talk a little bit, um, a little bit more about myself. So I have no problem talking about that. And what I call it the Paul Harvey, I call it the rest of the story, things that you might not have seen in my bio. So just a few items uh, to, to clarify. First, as you have heard or have seen, I am a current president at Miles Community College in Miles City, Montana. Um, it's in rural eastern Montana. Um, it's a wonderful place. It's got some great academic programs, great technical programs, and really serves this community very well. So I've been honored to be the community college president um, at that institution. That's, I've been doing that for the last five and a half years. So, but previously, something you might not know is when I worked at Montana State University Billings, I worked there for eight years as the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management. And within that, we had a two-year technical arm. We had a two-year college. It was called the City College. So my role as a senior leader on campus was to um, work with that two-year um, college. And so I have a, now 13 plus years of experience working with the two-year sector and I absolutely fell in love with it. I fell in love with it back when I was working with not just the two-year but the four-year and the graduate programs but I absolutely fell in love with it uh, because what it does and it changes people's lives and what it does for the community itself. So I fell in love with the two-year education and so where I'm at um, uh, now 
at Miles Community College allows me to be a president and help lead an institution in helping create those, um, what I would consider those environments that helps uh, change students' lives. Also, something you might not know is that I am an associate consultant for Ruffalo Noel Levitz. And Ruffalo Noel Levitz uh, works with um, enrollment planning and enrollment consulting for colleges and universities. So I've been doing that now for about eight years, but the last roughly five years I've been doing work within strategic enrollment planning. And so I really enjoy that work. I love that work. I love the ability to help shape like Miles Community College. I'd love to be able to bring that information and expertise um, here to you as well and talk about enrollment and enrollment planning. So I do do that on, on the backside. I, do, I did grow up in the student affairs ranks um, in higher education now for 30 years. Uh, but that doesn't mean I've never been in the classroom. So some of, the, some of you out there who might be thinking about what kind of educational or teaching experience do you have? I have had the great opportunity to be pretty much in the classroom at each institution I worked at. So um, whether it be a site class, whether it be a, a leadership course, a first year experience course, I've taught graduate classes at Montana State University Billings. Matter of fact, I was a courtesy faculty for the College of Education there. Um, I was in third grade and I knew I wanted to be a teacher. So I, I'm a lifelong educator in some ways, um, but I absolutely do enjoy the learning environment that happens in the classroom, but I also absolutely adored the learning environment that happens outside the classroom. And that's what really sucked me into this whole um, uh, student affairs work. Um, with that, um, what I wanted to say is that I have um, absolutely wonderful support. I have uh, my wife of 29 years, my better half, her name is Carrie, and she's probably watching right now, so I want to say hi. <laughs> and my two, I have two sons, two grown sons, who have graduated uh, from college, one of them from a two-year technical school within uh, uh, IT work, and the other one is graduating with a, a degree in business marketing and, and uh, pro golf management from New Mexico <laughs> State University. Uh, so um, that's just a little bit more about me. Um, so what I was asked to do is to provide about a 10 or so minute presentation. And what I would like to do is talk a little bit about um, something that I, 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 I love, but at the same time, I was inspired by your website, and it's about student success. And what do we do as a community college with student success? So when I was taking a look at your website, there was a couple things that really attracted me. One of them was that when I take a look at it, you have kind of taglines, improving lives, and improving communities. And then you also have own your future. So those things really meant something to me. Improve your lives or improve your communities and own your future. So my question is at Mojave Community College, what are we doing to improve lives and improve our communities? And how do we help us and our students own their future? How do we own our future, right? So improving lives, improving communities. That's what I want to try to talk a little bit about today. So when I scrolled through your website, I also found that there was mention of five testimonials. Okay, you had Cal Sheehy, you had Brian, Marshall, Kayla, and you also had uh, Jean. And what I liked about Kayla's story is that's an amazing story. If you haven't seen it yet, go on and watch that testimonial. That says something about who you are because these are five different people from five different backgrounds coming to Mojave at different points in their life and having success. So those are great. So that inspired me to think, what am I going to talk about? I want to talk about that. I want to talk about those improving lives and improving uh, communities. So I'm going to try to attach those here in a minute. For my end, um, what I wanted to look at is to help you understand my perspective is I'm going to share two quick stories, student stories with you that I think really do represent. And then I want to talk about some commonalities with those. So I'm going to take... Um, I'm going to say um, her name is Sam. Sam was a, a student or was a potential student when I was working at Montana State University Billings. And if you were all were working at the time of the recession, so picture 2009, what started to change. So here was this woman. She was a single mother, three kids, um, working some service jobs, all of a sudden laid off and didn't know what path she wanted to take in her life, right? She was struggling. But she knew that she enjoyed this healthcare environment. She knew she wanted to help others. Luckily, she became uh, CNA certified. But she wanted to get into the nursing program. But life is very difficult for her. Financial side is very difficult for her. So in my office, through a group of donors, through our foundation, through our chancellor and myself, 
created a, an emergency loan fund. And it was a set of dollars that these donors, local folks in the town, realized that this adult learner needs additional assistance. Multiple adult learners needed that assistance, especially during this, this recession crisis. So she comes to my office. She's getting into the nursing program, but she needed this extra money. I had no problem in offering her this emergency loan fund. The nice thing about that, the donors really didn't fully expect it to be repaid. Not a bad, not a bad thing, right? So there was something about this process that I was able to help her from that in with the help of donors to help her get in, provide the financial assistance. In three years, she graduated. She came to my office with tears in her eyes. And she wanted to thank me, but it wasn't me that she was thanking. She was thanking the faculty, the nursing faculty that guided her and gave her that mentoring, challenged and supported her. That was huge. She wanted to thank the donors who provided that financial assistance to help her and her family get through that tough time. She wanted to tell me that she was thankful she landed a great nursing job in Billings, Montana, and it was absolutely wonderful. Changed her life, right? We just improved a life. You can all probably understand and take a look at that and say you all have stories. How many of you have had a story like that, that somebody you know that went through that had that background? Right? All the hands raised. I love that. So that's the whole idea about this. Now I have three other stories. I won't go into those. But the commonality that I have seen from the community colleges, higher education in general, there's usually five kind of core things that I saw that helps students be successful from that manner. The first one is having an environment or a culture of care. And what I mean by that is that you have faculty who care about that individual. In a community college, we're a teaching institution. And as a teaching institution, our goal is to provide the best support function in the classroom and out of the classroom. So when you have faculty that understand and talk to those students, get to know them and provide that mentoring, provide the best learning environment for that student to succeed, see them stumble, get them off the ground, help them um, get back on the right path. That's something that's very important. When you have support services that do the exact same thing. When you have people from the outside, other support services like voc rehab or veteran services or whatever it is that comes in to help, help assist that student, help us assist that student, those external. The other one, um, so that culture of care is very, very important. Okay. Um, the other one is having some sort of pathway developed so when that student comes in our door, we can share with them exactly what it will take to be able to complete. And also the understanding that sometimes life gets in the way and there's off-ramps. If you're dealing with guided pathways, there's, there's a, there's, you're on a freeway. And if there's an opportunity to off-ramp at one moment, because instead of doing nursing, I want to be a phlebotomist, I can do that. But what if I want to on-ramp back on to do nursing? or I want to do med lab tech or radiologic technologies. So what is that opportunity? But to have that in front of them is, is key. The other one is really developing what I consider those industry partnerships. Because a lot of success stories start with the ability for a student and the college to be able to have that opportunity to work with industry to develop those work-based learning environments. There's nothing better than a student who goes from the classroom to an internship to an apprenticeship, to whatever else it is, and allowing them to learn and applying what they're learning in the classroom. And the more you can do that, the better off and better success stories you'll have. Because they're going to land jobs. My oldest son, that's exactly what happened to him. He landed a job based on an internship he did at an op center at a bank. And that's absolutely wonderful. So those experiences. Um, the other one I want to share is, is understanding self-efficacy. The mindset of our students that walk through the door, how successful are they? Are they confident and do they believe they can achieve? And I really do hope that they can achieve. But sometimes, and you've seen it, how many times have you seen students walk through the door and you're looking at them and you go, ooh, that student doesn't look confident, doesn't know if they believe in themselves. And it could be because maybe they don't internally or they were told at one point in their life that you're never going to make it. My sister was working with the high school counselor when she was in high school and was told that she's not college material. She goes on to the Votech school in Missoula, Montana and gets her medical trans transcriptionist degree and has done very well in her life. And believe me, that was college. She was college ready, was college rigor. It was a great, great opportunity for her. So sometimes the self-efficacy comes from those moments. We have to be able to work through that and develop the right mindset of our students. The last one 
that I wanted to share is I think the commonality that I've seen is the money and the resources behind the scenes to be able to help all these students, whether it be federal financial aid, tuition discounting models, providing tuition waivers, or um, foundation work with a scholarship drive and providing scholarships for adult learners, for uh, high school graduating senior, for veterans, whatever else it is, having that ability. If we were to take those five things and really have that pretty solid at any college across the United States, I think we're going to see more and more of these success stories. So what I also did is took a look at your mission statement. The other day I had an opportunity with the, the board, Board of Governors, um, they handed me the slip. And I loved it, because what's the first thing I did? I started underlining what I considered were five key kind of concepts within your mission statement. You talk about being learning-centered. You talk about serving all constituents. You talk about inspiring excellence through innovation and in empowering students to succeed. There's five things in there, learning-centered, all constituents, inspiring excellence, innovation, and success. So my question is, how do we overlay those? How do we overlay the five common things to help people be successful with your mission statement and what does that create? What does that create from a, a future strategic plan, a future direction, and what can we do with that? And I think that's a wonderful thing to look at. Now, I don't have all the answers at this time. I'm not your president um, and I've only been here for two days. I have looked at your website. I have tons of binders full of information. But if I was here, those are some of the questions I would want to ask. And I guarantee you what I would find is a lot of excellent work, a lot of great thinking, a lot of student success stories. How do we build on that? So the, what I would try to bring to that is just my educational background, my higher ed background, my understanding of working and leading a community college. I think I have the ability to help ask those questions and help each of the sites, whether it be going out to Lake Havasu or Bullhead City or up to the North Mojave campus in Colorado City or here, is working with the individual deans that you have, working with the great faculty and staff that you have, bringing my experience from helping lead the dialogue to be able to work with the cabinet and say, how do we um, uh, plan for the future and develop the change that might be required for us to be even more successful or help our students be successful? So I would try to bring that to the table. I would also try to bring my foundation background and my foundation work. So I've, I've been on a foundation board. I, lead, I help um, lead a foundation at Miles Community College. I've done, been part of major fundraising campaigns. I've asked for large sums of money. As a president, that's my job. I need to do that. Community colleges now more, more than ever need to have that foundation work. So I do that. My other thing too though, and it was talked about today with the mayor. She talked about the talent pipeline. She stole my line. She talked about the talent pipeline. In order for us to create the success stories and then improving the communities, I said I'd get back to it, we need to have more people graduate with the degree, with the skills and competencies to fill the needs of our communities. Also, there's economic growth. We know through your economic impact analysis that for every $1 spent, there's a, what, a $2 or $2 or $2.80 return to the local taxpayers. We also know for every $1 a student spends, there's a $5 return. There's amazing stuff, but that economic impact from a graduate is immense. It's not just for the student, but for the community. So how do we work through that as well? Um, the last thing I would bring is we need to get more people in the seats. So my background in enrollment planning and strategic enrollment planning, at Miles Community College, in five years, we have increased our annualized FTE every single year. We're 33% higher in our enrollment. Um, and why? Because we firmly believe we need to get more people in our seats, it helps generate a revenue, but we're completing more students to join the workforce. So I would bring hopefully that information and expertise uh, to Mojave Community College. So I hope that makes some sense with the student success stories and resonates with you a little bit. And uh, that's what I wanted to share with you in my presentation. And I probably went five minutes long, so I apologize. But it is, I, it is the last part of the day. <laughs> so thank you all, thank you very much. So. So I'll just start right where you kind of left off. So you said in your entree that uh, you had done some things at your, your MCC, not this MCC, uh, to increase enrollment. Now, and you said it was a steady increase over a period of time. Now, my, the question then is, then how would you try to replicate that here? And then adding to that, how would you then also put something in place that would ensure retention? Great, yes, um, thank you for that question. And 
I, I want to, if I can be very clear, strategic enrollment planning and looking at enrollment means multiple things. It's not just a recruiter's job. It's not just marketing. It's not just retention. It's all of those involved. It's your academic program, your academic mix, it's your co-curricular, everything. So when you do strategic enrollment planning, you need to have all of those constituent groups at the table. You need to understand and be data informed in all of those areas if you're truly going to have a good strategic enrollment plan. And with the strategic enrollment plan, every single strategy that comes forward has the strategies and action items aligned. It's data informed. We believe this is the amount of enrollments we can create. And within that, we also plan our expenses and our revenue and see an ROI gain. The idea behind the scenes, if we develop a strategic enrollment plan that has 16 outstanding strategies that are retention related, academic program related, that are enrollment driven related, that are marketing related, co-curricular related, whatever else, you have 16 solid programs. The idea is that can that generate an ROI at the end that's seed money for future strategies. And I've seen that work very successful at community colleges and universities. It's a proven, it's a proven method. So what I would try to do here is um, be able to bring that expertise and really work with your enrollment staff, work with the deans, uh, work with the academic folks, and really have a good sit down and talk about what are our plans? Where are you currently at with your strategies? What are your current strategies you have in place right now? Are they talking to one another? And that's, that's, that's a big thing. So when I look at your current strategic plan, if I remember right, your third strategy talks about growth, and I think your first strategy within that, or your first goal is growth, but your first strategy within that is strategic planning, or strategic enrollment management, I think is what it says. So how do we take that information and say, let's talk more and more about growth, but what does that enrollment management mean? What does that enrollment growth mean by that one statement? And let me ask that question about, is it strategic? Is it planful? Is it futuristic? And does it involve everybody? And that's the question I would ask and be able to bring to the table. Um, now, would I initiate a specific um, consulting, so to speak? Um, process? No, not necessarily, because there's a lot of work involved. Um, uh, and but I would want to work with the enrollment team and the academic team to help introduce those concepts. Next question. As president of this college, what would you do to increase? Not that we have poor quality, but to increase and enhance and maintain the quality of faculty that we have now, especially in the, dis the difficult areas. Because as you heard one of some of the students tell you today, one of the concerns was having faculty teaching classes versus having it online. So what would you do as president if you in fact got that job to help make that go away? Yeah. Is this the magic wand question that you asked me earlier? Um, yeah, it's a great question because I think it's a challenge among pretty much any institution, especially community colleges in what I would consider rural areas. Um, Miles City, is very rural. I said this to the group earlier. There's rural, then there's frontier. We're frontier. And to be able to have um, good qualified faculty and retain them is very critical. Um, we don't want to have a lot of adjuncts. So we actually increased, I think now we're four more full-time faculty than we were five years ago. Part of that is an enrollment gain, part of that is, is academic driven. Um, what we need to do is take a look at it from a couple different perspectives. Is one, what is, the, what is the quality of the institution they're teaching in? And we need to understand that hopefully our faculty are coming in that they enjoy the work environment, that they get the student success side of things, that they enjoy the students they work with, they enjoy the community, but they also understand and they enjoy hopefully potentially the salary. That there's always a money factor involved with any employee on any college campus and understanding that from a faculty perspective and how do we take a look at that and how do we structure that. Um, so that would be one that you would want to look at. Um, two is the energy and the ability uh, for those faculty who are looking at Mojave Community College to say, how do I get engaged? What's the role of faculty in that college campus? When they start to evaluate Mojave Community College, can, can they say, I see how faculty are engaged in decision making? I see how faculty are engaged in the budget planning process. I see that the campus is open and communicative um, with what's going on. And that could be a very great place and enjoyable place to work. So I think some of those things come into play. Um, 
The other one too is probably taking a look at and where we've been slightly blessed um, in Miles Community College with having some long-standing faculty and been able to fill our faculty roles. Our nursing faculty at times is very difficult, um, but we keep after it, right? It's tenacity from an HR department. <laughs> Um, but but I, I would say the one thing is trying to connect, the more we're connected with industry within your area, the more expertise you, you will find within that industry. There might be an opportunity with a retiree, so I'm picturing your electrician program when you have John coming on, but I'm picturing like for us, we had retirees coming out of our county who now both work our full-time faculty for our heavy equipment and CDL program. If we didn't have the right environment and didn't work with them and understand them and they didn't know about us, we probably would not have them when we'd be still struggling today with full-time faculty. So it's kind of working with the industry to find the expertise within that. If there's somebody who's planning on retiring or doing some shared roles, let's get innovative, let's get creative with it to try to find the ability to get faculty to come in, teach on site, um, maybe be full-time faculty or kind of a half faculty slash working with the industry, but maybe you consider them in some type of capacity or role that they're a full-time faculty because of what they're doing. How do we get innovative and creative with that? So there's probably a lot of ways, but those are kind of some different angles. Okay, so you, if you get the nod, we call you and say, hey, come on down, and uh, offer you the position. What are you gonna do to make all the people that are here at this campus and the other four campuses feel that they shouldn't be anxious nervous and scared because of this new guy coming in. I know, I'm so mean. <laughs> you know, the one thing that I, I mentioned this yesterday, um, probably what I would like to do is develop a transition team. And so if I was asked to come down here and accept the position, um, and if, let's say the start date is July 1, so let's just pretend that. Um, what I would do is try, hopefully develop a, a transition team with the advice of uh, both the board as well as the cabinet, as well as the deans, uh, people from the EAC group, about who can sit on that to help provide me transitional information. Within that, how can that team help me provide the right information that I can share with people up front to help eliminate or alleviate any potential angst that would be coming down? So how can I then get to know people much better for maybe being afar or coming down here at different points, having on-campus meeting sites, having people ask me any question they want to ask, but I think that transition team can help eliminate some of those issues. But let's say I'm here on July 1st now. I'm here, transition team helped me get here. There's still some transition. Working with the uh, current interim president would be very helpful, but I have to be out and about. I have to have the dialogue. Um, I'll give you an example at Miles Community College. There was, when I came in, I think they just came off a very interesting review of a business model, business plan model, because I think there was fear because their enrollment declines and financial difficulties of maybe not being able to be a community college or maybe even being brought in under the Montana University system. So you can picture me being at the very first convocation standing up in front of them all and knowing that there's potential angst out there and being able to look at them and say this, we control our own destiny. We control our own destiny. And I think from that, that caused people to go, ah, take that step back and say, okay, so what does he mean by that? That we control our own destiny and that he's here to support us with that. And I think that started to kind of ease some things. And then from there, it was a lot of, a lot of communications, a lot of open communications with our faculty association, staff association, getting to know our students, working with our athletic coaches, you name it, um, getting to know them. Um, anytime you have a new person, because I'm here, let's say, I'm living here and I'm, my central office is here, but I need to also be traveling down to Lake Havasu and up to Colorado City. I need to be visible at each of those places, but I need to also rely on the deans. I need to understand the culture. I need to think through that. I need to get a feel for that. Um, so that's some of the things I think I would do to help hopefully eliminate some of that. So give us your philosophy in terms of how you would proceed being a newcomer uh, to this neighborhood, this community, this college, et cetera, for fundraising and working with the foundation, given that you got four different communities that you have to address, deal with, and also make happy. Yeah, no, another good question. I, I was thinking uh, through that with some foundation dialogue over the last couple of days is, um, one, I would be a, a, a new face and people would, would probably maybe not trust that right away. Um, in order to get them to understand and trust me, 
I have to know the story about Mojave Community College. And I have to have them know that I'm extremely passionate about student success. I'm extremely passionate about developing the right living or in like the right learning um, environments. That means physical environments. That means teaching, teaching and learning environments. And that means co-curricular environments. So I, I first I would have to make sure I have the story and I know the story and then be able to be out in front of them and utilize the current folks who are on each of the foundation at each of the sites to really work with them um, to best understand what's the current culture, who are the, the people that I need to be meeting with at first, people who are going to give me the open and honest answers, people who are going to tell me the what for and the what if. Those are all very, very critical when it comes to fundraising. First, know the story, get to know the people. So at Miles Community College example would be, when I got there, the goal was, based on the board, was to fundraise immediately a campaign to, to build our Ag Advancement Center. And that was a $3.5 million project. They have never raised that money before. Picture a small community, 8,000 people in the community, 12,000 in the district. Me coming in new, getting in front of people who are, this is the first time they've been asked for this type of money. What happened for me is the board wanted me to be very visible, so I got on every single board I possibly could. I started to know people. I started to get to know people. And from there, I think people started to trust me. So when I went and asked for a million dollar gift, I think those people sitting across the table at least had a good feeling about me. They still had questions, but at least they had a good feeling about me. We raised the $3 million within two years and were able to build a building. The other 500,000 came internally, but $3 million in two years at a place of only 12,000 people. That means we had to tell the right story. And I was new to that, but I wasn't shy. I will never be shy to ask for money because here's the story. It's the people in this room. It's the students that I talked to yesterday and today. That's the story. Economic growth, economic development, workforce development. There's great stories here, so I would want to share that. So explain to us what your communication style is. For example, do I need to be nervous when I see you walking in the building or am I going to see you all the time? I'm really, really <laughs> nervous. No, I like to get out and about. Um, I, I don't typically just sit in my office. I, I want to be out and about. Um, so I, I try to be very visible um, within that. But I also want to be very respectful of the areas um, in which I am helping um, oversee. So therefore, working with the individual deans and making sure I communicate with them um, as I'm coming in and, and uh, wanting to visit with students or whatever else, I'll make sure I always do that and notify them. I um, would never want anybody to be nervous. I'm a very positive person. I give everybody the utmost respect. And I, I'm just coming in just for me to learn, right? So that first year, it probably, I'm a firm believer for me to get acclimated and understand and really help make um, change or and or understand our current culture, I need a full year. And what I mean by that is there's, you take higher education, there's a one year cycle. If I start July 1, I still have to see what happens to get ready for fall. I have to see what happens through fall to spring. I need to see retention rates. I need to see summer planning and then come back to, to June 30th. And I think from there, and me just observing and going in and trying to get a feel of the lay of the land um, is very, very critical to be able to do that. Because I want that one year to be able to tell me a lot so then I can come back and help answer questions, help provide direction, uh, be data informed, all those type of things. Um, so I would never want anybody to be nervous because my communication style, hopefully as you can tell, is very open. Um, I, enjoy, I enjoy the work environment. so. Um, I would definitely be very open to the communication, both ways, too, both ways. So the next question is your administrative style. So you, just a few minutes ago you said you were open. So does that mean you're open to every, any and everybody? Or does that mean you selectively are open? What exactly does that mean? As far as administrative style, explain what style you use and give us examples yeah, um, for both the upper echelon on down to students. Got it. Um, open to everybody. Actually, a, a president needs to understand that there's an external and an internal part of the job. And what that means also, is you've got to have an open door for the external and the internal. I, can, I should never ever shut anybody away from my office because I don't want to talk to them. If they want to come in and talk to me, I need to be open to that dialogue and I need to listen. It doesn't, mean if it, it doesn't matter if it's a donor or somebody just a concerned citizen in town who pays taxes. Um, which I've had those type of conversations, to a student who has a concern, 
um, because we're a small campus, they get to know me, then all of a sudden I'll get an email from a student saying, hey, I have this concern in class. They'll bypass everything else and come to me. Now, I have no problem in working with that student, but I'll try to get them back in the right process. But I have no problem in having that open dialogue um, with people. So open means open, okay? Now, um, for me to be out and be external means that sometimes I'm going to pop in people's offices as well. And I hope that's okay. <laughs> and that means industry. That means going to see a CEO. Um, that means going to pop into Mayor Miles' office and saying hello. Hey, what are you hearing? So I think it goes kind of both ways. And I need to be very adaptive and understand that that's something I do need to do. Um, so yes, very open to that. I, I think I should have an open door policy as a college president. So what's your style for, I guess, philosophy and style for working with K through 12s? And be specific about what programs you think are appropriate, inappropriate, good, bad, whatever. Yeah. Um, the K through 12 connection is probably more critical than maybe ever before because of the current technical potential needs. So, and, and here's what I mean by that is uh, dual enrollment has become a very big thing. So dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment, early start, whatever you want to call it, those are all becoming very, very critical because I think people across the nation are seeing that as a viable solution for affordable education early on, but getting them into a guided pathway, getting them into something, whether it be a career technical ending point after as a senior or one year later, or it's a pathway for them to get, hopefully, affordable credits to be able to move on and transfer. So I, I think we, as in Miles Community College, we have been very, very open to that. Some of our enrollment gain has been based off dual enrollment. We basically doubled our dual enrollment in the last five years, thanks to the hard work of many individuals on campus. Also the hard work of your high school administrators and all the high schools, those teachers and so forth. Um, so one, I think it's very important. I think it's very important to be innovative and creative with it. So one thing we're doing at Miles is work with the local high school on trying to find what we're considering. So picture this, and I don't know what your data is here. I can't remember at this given moment, but picture a high school here in Kingman or in Bullhead City. How many of them are going on after graduation to post-secondary higher education? In Miles City in Custer County District High School, about 50% are. That means 50% aren't. In the state of Montana, we throw out the 40%. It's about 44% aren't in the state of Montana. How do we best tackle that? Because we know from labor market analysis, there is a huge gap. We need to get them into the seats, to get them trained in some way. High schools are starting to do what I believe is a much better job in trying to provide those pathways starting in their freshman and sophomore year to junior and senior year. But there still is a direct pathway and it needs to be happening between that and the community college. So what we have uh, attempted to do is now we have a dual employed person with the high school and with the college. And what she is doing is working hard to identify that 50% or that 40% to get them to understand that what is it you want to do, a career path that maybe in high school then take these, do a dual enrolled with MCC, and then you can finish then after one year or whatever else, now you have a degree and you have something that's going to change hopefully your life going to make you think differently. It's going to give you a better high paying job. And so I think we need to be innovative with look, working specifically and directly with those high schools. Um, so one thing I do want to say with dual enrollment, and I, and I think people need to be very careful with this. I've seen this happen. Strategic enrollment planning, within that what they'll do is say, well, why don't we just go after more dual enrollments and that will increase our enrollment. It will. It can. But let me tell you this, if you're going to have a true strategic enrollment plan and be planning for the future, you need to diversify. You can't just rely on dual enrollment to increase your enrollment. It has to come from other pathways, other things such as academic, your retention, and so forth. So as we build and look at dual enrollment as one method of a strategy, I want to make sure that there's many other strategies that hit many other students. And this dual enrollment is just one part of who we are. So I would just share that because I think sometimes that's important. People don't, don't quite get that. So you and I assume your wife has considered the fact that this is nothing like Montana. And, and so as a result of that, uh, tell us why you and your wife decided that this is some place you should be interested in coming to. Um, it's, 
we, as I said before, we spent four years at Flagstaff. So we both worked for NAU. And in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, we fell in love with this area, northern part of, of Arizona. And we've been through Kingman, and we've been to Bullhead City, we've been down to Laughlin, we've been to Lake Havasu. We've actually been up through Colorado City. Last year, actually, I, I was through here. We went to visit friends in Flagstaff. So came through Kingman and, and went up to Vegas. So we had a great time. But we've always loved this area. So for me and my wife, it was a natural look. Um, we, we started this about a year ago to say, if I was to leave Miles Community College, and that's a big if, um, because Miles Community College has been in, incredible to me and my wife, and the people there have been incredible. The board has been incredible. So when we go to look at leaving, where would that truly be? And we identified certain spots, and Mojave Community College, this area was one of them. So when I saw the presidency position open, um, for me and my wife, it was probably in a way a no-brainer for us. Um, we are to the point in our career where um, I'm trying to plan that retirement point down the road, and we wanted to be at a place that I know I can be, this is my last stop. And so if, to us, this seemed to be that best fit for that. The other thing, too, is when I look at Mojave Community College in the system, I love that. Now, I worked in Montana State University system. I worked for MSU Billings. I worked in a system. I was on that side of being a senior administrator at one of the campuses and understanding sometimes how the communication lines flow, decision makings flow within a system. I would love to be able to work in a system like that, to be able to say, hey, this, talk to, to Dean Woods or Dean Hamlin or Dean Gilbert or Dean uh, Crowley, 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 thank you. I almost said Crowley, Crowley. Um, to, um, to be able to work with them and establish an open communication and an o open system um, and to be able to do things that I believe that a, a system should be able to do in regards of still adhering to a one common, one MCC, here's our mission statement, but understanding the uniquenesses at each of the institutions and honoring that uniqueness because I felt that at MSU Billings was the uniqueness always identified. I don't know if it was. And I would never want to do that to all of you. So that's what I would do um, by coming here. And so that attracted me. That attracted me this. Also, it's independent. Um, it's one of those that we work with the board. The board manages this system. I'm not a president in a Maricopa system. And I love this feel. I love the smallness. It's about the right size, all that type of stuff. So as you can tell, there's not, what, seven factors I just said? Um, there's probably about ten other ones. <laughs> but those are the main ones that really attracted us to this. It is different than Montana, uh, but we're very familiar with it. So having talked to you today, I, I, I'm pretty confident you've done your homework about us. And as a result of that, you also know that we're fiscally in good shape. So tell us how, as president, you're going to keep us there. I, I am very, um, one, very honored to be considered for this role and, and at the same time um, very impressed with what I was able to find um, by doing a lot of digging um, in, in regards to your website, taking a look at state information. I was able to look at your, both your budget approved as well as the state allocations. I was able to talk to some friends who are community college presidents in Arizona and receive information about some initiatives um, that are going on there uh, both within the Arizona Community College Coordinating Council um, and initiatives that are happening down in the, the state legislature. Um, so I really did recognize that you seem to be a very stable type of financial institution, um, understanding what you get from your tax base, your tuition, the state, and so forth. Um, what I would try to do is continue on that. We in Montana are also very conservative. Um, we tried to make sure that we built a budget and build a budget that has a, a zero base at the end of the year. If we have some end of the year excess, what do we do with our reserve? Um, how are we being planful with our auxiliary services, our plant, our maintenance? All of those things come into play. And so um, what we did at Miles Community College is establish a uh, planning budget and assessment process. Now, I'm not saying I would bring that here, but I'm just sharing this as an example that I think it helps us making sure we're more well-informed of what the budget really truly does. And that means everybody somehow gets involved in it. And that would mean what we do is we had 30-something individual listening sessions where a faculty member for a program came in and presented not just their budget ideas, but also had to put it down on paper on 
what their strategies are in their academic program, how it fits with the mission, how it fits with our core themes for Northwest Standard Accreditation. So they had to share that and then what their strategies are for the year. And when you talk about the budget, how does the budget align with that? That's the basic idea. What we found from that the last two years is that people now so much more better understand their budget. So now the budget dialogue is more open, natural. I think people are starting to understand where we might see some hiccups. They're more predictive. And I would like to be able to bring something like that to make sure that our budget planning process is uh, still very conservative that we take a look at future investments, that we still try to invest, and we're also open and honest with reductions. And that process allows us to look at that. So I would very much honor and take a look at what you have uh, with your 40 plus million dollar budget and what it means to coming back. The other thing too I like about this budget is really your budget is all about coming back to serve the educational environment and the students. Um, it really is about the academic programs, current technical startups, it's about capital improvement which I absolutely love. You, you have a, a great process put in front of you. So um, I would love to be able to keep that going. Next question is, tell us your philosophy of student services. Um, one is absolutely necessary um, because there's a lot of issues that happens outside the classroom. Um, in order to have any type of good strategic enrollment plan, you need to take a look at your upfront student services and recruitment services to financial aid services, advising services, and so forth. Uh, my background in all these years has really taken a look at um, how can that outside the classroom environment really impact positively student and student success. Um, now I know there's a lot of different movements over the last so many years about student services areas. So let's take advising for general. There's been a lot of changes in how we advise and why we advise. Um, there's multiple methods to do that. There's guided pathway movements that are dictating and, and, and uh, changing some of that thinking. Um, faculty advising has taken on a different shape. Um, so all those things need to come into play and are very, very important to the student success process. Um, so I, I, I firmly believe and I would support anything that we would have. The, the idea though also is the philosophy of student services being such a prevalent thing means we're probably going to have some commonalities and efficiencies within our student services at each campus. But that does not ignore the fact that there's uniqueness as well. And I think those need to be explored so each dean has ideas and thoughts around we are looking at this support structure put in place for students because of this X program or these type of X students we have here are more or less socially, economically impacted than other students. There's sometimes some different ways of thinking that we need to look at. So very much honoring that because the best way for us to improve enrollment and improve student success is to make sure we're truly looking at that at each campus and what that means. But that doesn't still also ignore the fact that we need to take a look at efficiencies for budget purposes, but also efficiencies in the shared knowledge and shared expertise that we have across the board. Um, so very, very critical to the student success process. So give us your definition of what a quality educational course at MCC would be. And if you found a course to not meet those quality standards, how would you go about defining that? And then what would you do about it? Well, uh, there's two ways to look at this. Um, you can look at quality education, quality instruction in a couple different ways. One is that you can use an academic program prioritization process if you, if you follow Dickinson's work. Um, that's what we did both at MSU Billings and at Miles Community College. Um, you have the faculty help identify what those metrics are in identifying what is quality. Um, and I think that's very important. Obviously, faculty are in charge of the instruction, charge of curriculum, and they should be very much at the table when it takes a look at metrics to assess. Um, quality. Uh, so that's number one. I think quality also means good student learning outcomes. And I think that should always, always be reviewed periodically or yearly or whatever else that is based on the metrics that we identify through the faculty being involved. So um, that would be very critical. So um, at Miles, I would say that we've done an absolutely wonderful job. What we did is we did an academic program process, prioritization process. Each faculty then established, or the faculty group established, the core set of metrics that were going to be used to assess quality. And so what they did then is we also did the shadow work or uh, supplemental work behind the scenes to do more of the metric stuff in regards to um, enrollments, uh, cost for education, completion rates, and all that. But the faculty really took a look at what they meant by, is it a quality program? What is our advising board saying about our quality program? Are we meeting the competencies and skills required? for these students to graduate and go on and get a job. And 
So um, that process then led to the discussion about quality, we need to improve. At the same time, we need to sit there and take a look at this program can grow. And then at the same time is taking a look at some of the data, is this, does this program need to exist? Or it's not existing, does it need to change? The faculty can help lead that dialogue, but in our strategic enrollment plan, all that comes forward and plays within that. And then the faculty are developing action plans as part of strategy development, uh, enrollment development. Um, so from a quality perspective, we have some great programs because our faculty look at that. And they better understand that now through data, being more data informed, understanding um, what the advisory boards are saying, understanding the learning outcomes, using our online product to measure general ed, um, core competencies that are required. And so there's a lot more of that look and feel on the college campus. I really do believe that of all of our courses and our instructors are high quality. Now, if we find one that we need to tweak and change, um, then we definitely have the conversation with the faculty about tweaking and changing that curriculum and why it looks or realigning it, especially with the new program idea. So there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, but um, we do have some very high quality programs based on some of those metrics and, and review. So for, uh, I won't, well, we may have time for two more. So for this question, tell us what your philosophy as president would be in terms of keeping the facilities looking like they look now and maintaining them and staying within the limits of the budget. So um, my background at Northern Arizona, well, actually it started before that, but at Northern Arizona, um, I spent three years managing the residential facilities. And if you know NAU, there's a lot of residential facilities. At that time, it was 1.6 million square feet of space. We knew that that living environment needed to start changing. So a lot of assessments on um, living learning communities. So therefore, if you have living learning communities, what should the living environment physically really look like? How are we answering concerns about, from students about their living environment? Um, how do we make those improvements? So I, I fully was immersed into that for three years and taking a look at physical environments and what it means. I also connected it, um, I was talking to students earlier about being a social behavioralist, but um, some of you in here, I don't know if you've ever heard of Kurt Lewin. Kurt Lewin it was a social behavioralist probably back in the 20s or 30s. And basically what Kurt Lewin said, and I've loved this and I've used it with facilities planning, is that the behavior of any individual is a product of their um, interaction with the environment. So the behavior is a product of, the inter of their interaction with that environment. And it's not just the classroom environment, the teaching environment, the social environment, it's the physical environment. Students learn better when the physical environments are new, when the physical environments are um, at a standard that really we need to have for um, the best learning possible. Um, there's new ways of thinking about learning in regards to like teal classrooms, really retaking a look at that, but having the best learning environments possible is very critical. So any type of facilities planning, I would always ask, what are those environments doing to cause a better, um, uh, I guess better behaviors, both learning behaviors and living behaviors and so forth of our students with that exchange in that environment, that, that working in our and or um, learning environment. So um, I would always ask that question and I think that's something for me. Um, so my background would be walking, taking a look at what facilities you have, working with the deans, working with students, and what are some certain buildings that we have right now in, and I don't know what your facilities master plan says. Your facilities master plan might have already identified seven or eight buildings that need to be tweaked, changed, torn down, or new. And so I would very much take a look at that. But also within that, doing it within the structure that has been established so successfully, it appears, with that budget management. And how do we do that? If we can do that without going out to the taxpayers, that's great. Um, but we know that we have work to do based on a long range plan. It's how to then we pull all that together in the budget planning process to um, hopefully create the best learning environments possible. So in keeping with that theme, so then how would you also ensure to maintain that IT areas or maintain the infrastructure. Obviously, we have four campuses. We need to communicate. We do various video broadcasts, et cetera. So what would be your philosophy as president to ensure that that is up to date, current, and we don't have somebody waving and it takes two minutes to see the wave go around? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it just, it's just understanding, and I think your IT staff seems to be doing an outstanding job from what I can see and tell that um, it's understanding and um, learning what the new technologies are coming out and trying to get those technologies in place. 
Um, and I know that's hard because technology changes every single day and there's always new stuff out there and sometimes they're costly. So I think it's funny what the best product is to help us continue to improve. Um, so you're using Zoom right now, so Zoom is your product, is that correct? So you're using Zoom. Hopefully right now when I wave, the people looking aren't seeing me wave two minutes from now. So it's, what's that? And YouTube, yeah, and you're, you're putting it through YouTube. So anyways, hello. Um, one of those where I think the, looking at technology and understanding how technology is changing and its impact in the classroom and out of the classroom um, and also how technology needs to be wrapped into in some ways the academic programs themselves because technology is becoming more and more prevalent within a lot of your current technical programs. So I think not only are we looking at the infrastructure, we're also trying to take a look at technologies that will help the learning environment, help students learn um, new um, technologies that will help them in the workplace, gets them a step ahead. So I think all of that needs to come into place. Understanding there's money, so what do we have set aside for technology improvements on an annual basis? What does your budget truly say? If I would look at a line item, what would that say about annual um, allocations for technology improvements, for facilities improvement? I would want to look at that and work with the deans to find out what those issues are and, and try to make sure we're always up to date as best as possible. And this is the last one, because you're supposed to be a meet, so we need to have time left for that. But the last question would be, for the community, what and how would you as president be, out, be able to go out in the community and get people to know who you are and that you are supporting the community? And that's to say all four, not just Kingman. Mm -hmm. um, you would be one uh, to help with that assistance, um, each of the deans. Um, also, uh, we had a conversation with the cabinet uh, yesterday morning, and uh, I, in my current job right now, I do a lot of external and internal. Um, here, what I can tell is what I would need to do within that first year when I talked about the cycle is I would have to also be very, very external. And that means understanding that we have a, a cabinet team, we have deans, we have other individuals who have expertise who can help with a lot of the internal stuff. That doesn't mean I'm not involved in some of the decision making, but I know I need to be out and about as much as possible. And so I need to rely and trust on the current internal staff to be able to do that. Um, but in order to be external, I need to work with the foundation boards. They help um, work with the mayors, work with the city folks, work with the deans. Um, I think you can count on me to be hopefully very visible in the communities because as a, as a current president, I understand the value of that. It's very necessary. Um, from what I've heard so far from the mayors, what I've heard from uh, some community folks and folks on uh, foundations is that um, they would greatly appreciate me to help be in front and be somewhat of the face and telling the right story to people. And in order to do that, I need to be out. I can't just sit in my office. And so I would love to do that here for Mojave Community College. I would love to pop down to uh, Lake Havasu um, in the middle of winter. <laughs> 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 um, but um, yes, very much involved in the community. Had to be visible. Okay, five o'clock almost. So uh, why don't you give him a round of applause? Thank you. And those of you who would like to come up and talk to him and get to be a little better, come on up. Thank you.